السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم، الحمد لله رب العالمين، ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين، ولا عافية ولا مقيم، اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على عبدك ورسولك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم، وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا. Alright, a couple of things first. Number one, I don't even do my own taxes. I did a degree in accounting just so I could say that I did a degree in accounting. I completely kicked it to the side and I've never used it in my life and I don't plan on it. Except for Islamic finance. <laughs> Build on that. Uh, secondly, with the Qabila, um, can, I voice, can I voice my opinion on it? I'm allowed to. Okay. Well, number one, it shouldn't be Qabila Lebron. That would be absolutely terrible. Just ask for a line if they would have named her Qabila, Qabila Dwight Howard. I'm going to try to be Number two, um, Qabila Safa, awesome name. I don't know why no one has taken that Qabila yet. I think that's an incredible name. So I like Qabila Safa the best. Uh, that's my personal opinion. But I'm just saying, you guys can still choose to go against what I'm saying. I'm not, I'm not imposing here, because I think Qabila Nakhay is pretty cool too. As Rasulullah said, and I want to really, really, really thank the volunteers here. MashaAllah, like, this is an incredible poor group. It's going to be a very special Qabila. Every Qabila that you go to, you, you know, you get a feel for the volunteers, the way that they are. Some Qabilas that you go to, you get stuck with someone like Nasir, right? <laughs> <laughs> Which is a good thing, because Nasir is awesome. And, you know, that can, Qabila, no. Some Qabilas that you go to, no, seriously, you know, you might have a few people, just a few people that are really kind of doing it without Ihsan, without, you know, not really doing their job with excellence. They're, you know, I'm a volunteer, I'm not paid to do this, you know, I just, we'll just organize it, we'll figure it all out when we get to the class. You know, there's nothing going on when you get to the class, uh, systems aren't working, they never even tested out, you know, the sound, they never tested out anything, and we'll just figure it out, we'll just let the, we'll just let the sheikh do all the, the work, you know, free Friday, hopefully we'll get everybody to come. So some Qabilas have that attitude, subhanAllah, you can see the difference between that and when you have a group of volunteers that really do things with ihsan, that really do things with excellence. And this is, this, the core group of volunteers here is absolutely amazing. Um, I'm actually really sad that Arsalan goes back to Edmonton, goes back to Canada, because mashallah, like, this guy has text messaged me more than my wife, like, <laughs> in the last, like, month. And I'm not even playing about that, that's not even a lie. <laughs> I've gotten more texts from him than my wife, it's like every little detail. And then eventually, I stopped answering him, so I apologize, you know, I was like, alright, this is getting out of hand. He's asking me, like, what I want for lunch a month from now. <laughs> But that's serious Ihsan, and then this morning uh, we did get to go to the beach, alhamdulillah, I completely empty, going to the beach at Fajr. Uh, if I teach behind the scenes here, inshallah, which I hope I will soon, because I think, again, this is a really good group, uh, we, we talk about contemplation and tafakkur and, and introspection and stuff like that, and you guys live close to some beautiful, beautiful beaches, mashallah. I don't think the palm trees are real, because if you see palm trees in Medina, and you see palm trees here, there's a big difference between a palm tree in Medina and a palm tree in Florida. So I don't think you have the right to call yourselves Qabila Tafir. But again, I'm not imposing. Right? I'm just saying. Anyway, so it gets a topic. And this is a topic, seriously, that, you know, everywhere you go across the board, it's a lot. I, you know, unfortunately, as Muslims, sometimes we tend to ignore what people are really going through. We tend to ignore the issues. And people are generally not happy. Now subhanAllah, everything has gotten better in terms of technology, in terms of convenience in life, in terms of comfort, right? We've got bigger houses now, we've got cars, we can travel around the world in, in 20 hours, you know, we can do so much now. And we're still not happy, and in fact, we're getting, you know, we're, we're getting more and more depressed. Suicide rates are on the rise consistently. Um, over the past 10 years, the suicide rate has increased every single year. Every year the suicide rate is going up. Every year uh, when it comes to happiness in the home, divorce rates are going up, right? Drug addiction is going up. So everything that represents anxiety, everything that represents depression is going up. And subhanAllah, I could see it even when I was an imam. I was an imam for six years in New Orleans. And every single time, you know, I sit with somebody, the first thing they say is like, I'm just not happy. You know, I've got it all. Why can't I be happy? And this is, I don't want this to turn into like a Joel Olstein type you know, sermon. Because Islam is practical. Islam is all about practicality. 
Islam is all about taking co solid, concrete steps, not just like, okay, we should all be happy and why is everyone so upset? It's not about that. It's actually looking deeply inside yourself and trying to figure things out. Now, there are a few things there, that few, few important points there that a lot of times we try to blame external factors. If I'm not happy, that must mean that, you know, somebody did hasad their nazar or put the evil eye on me, right? That must mean I'm possessed. Right? It's funny because everyone always tries to claim that they're possessed. That, like when you're an imam, like everyone always tries to come to you and say, Hey, I think I've got a jinn inside me. Like, okay. <laughs> Hello to you and your jinn. You know, let's, let's talk about this. Right? And I'm like, well, how do you feel when you read Quran? Oh, I feel so good when I read Quran. But then when I stop reading Quran, then I start getting disturbed and those types of things. But when I go to the Quran and I, and I, and I read, then, you know, I, I feel so good. Right? And I'm like, well, that is, that is, uh, a very telling thing about you, that means you're human and that means you're not possessed. Because if you were possessed, you wouldn't feel good when you read Quran. Right? And then it's like, no shit, but I actually get some pain right here in the night when I start reading Surah Al Fatiha, it starts stinging and stuff like that. It's like, no, you're human. Right? Life is very, very, life is tough. You know, you, you go through things. SubhanAllah, you, you will naturally find obstacles in your life. And you're not always going to be happy. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called the Qur'an shifa ima fi sudur as, as Brother Munir read, it's a, it's a cure for the hearts. Because when you turn back to the Qur'an and you turn back to it the way you're supposed to turn back to it, you naturally get to ignore the inconveniences of life and you start to focus on what's important. So inshallah, I hope you guys will find this seminar beneficial. It's my first time doing a seminar like this all together, speaking about happiness and depression, but I hope inshallah ta'ala we get something out of it. Now, the first thing, is understanding what gives you happiness. Right? It starts off with that. Understanding what gives you happiness. This is one of my favorite quotes, uh, although it's from unknown. So I could have just claimed it, but I didn't claim it. But being happy doesn't mean that everything is perfect. It means that you've decided to look beyond the imperfections. So you come to a conclusion that, you know what? Life is not going to be perfect. Life is not fair, but Allah Azza wa Jal is fair. Life is not fair, but Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala is fair. And you start to try to figure out what's going to give you happiness start to, to increase those things. And it's very important here to understand the role of du'a, the role of supplication. Right? Uh, and it's very powerful because the angel actually writes when a person is only in their role. And I'm talking about the role of du'a for parents and future parents. When the, when, when the soul is still in the womb, one of the things that the angel writes is Sa'id al shaqi happy or miserable. And that doesn't mean that, you know what, that person's actions, uh, and we're going to talk about Qadr and Divine, divine Decree and how that, how that relates to everything. That doesn't mean that that person's actions don't have an effect. That means that the way that a person will act, everyone is capable of happiness and everyone is capable of misery. Right? But being capable of happiness doesn't make you a happy person. Being a happy person that sometimes gets, gets sad, and even the Prophet Sallallahu got sad, that means that you're Sa'id, that you have a characteristic of being Sa'id. But Al Imam Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, he said something very powerful. He said that the body, that a person is comprised of two things, al jasad wa ruh body and soul. There are, you know, you, everyone is made up of these two things. And the ruh, right, everyone always asks about ruh and soul and what that means. The ruh, when it comes to the jasad, when the ruh meets with the jasad, soul and body meet, you become nafs, right? You're a self. Now you're striving because your soul naturally inclines to what? Your soul naturally inclines to what? Allah. Your soul, your ruh, naturally inclines towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your soul naturally inclines towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your body naturally inclines towards, you know, desires and things of that sort. That's why you find people that are like animals. Like literally, the same things that, that animals do. There's some human beings that will do the same things. They'll live out their desires just like an animal would live their desires. So what you have when you have nafs is you consistently have this fight that's going on. Right? Trying to, trying to find peace, trying to find some happiness. And that's why you consistently have to fight those desires. You have to consistently fight those animalistic tendencies to try to discipline yourself. And that gives you happiness. Now, Imam Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah said, just as the body is created, that's just as the person is made up of jasad and ruh. Everything finds comfort in its source. And the body is created from the earth, and so the body finds comfort from its source. Right? So from eating and drinking and, and those types of things. Things of this world, the body finds pleasure in. And the soul can only be comforted 
by its source, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? That's the only way that the soul can find peace and the soul can find comfort. And they affect each other. Right? This is the only technical part of class, by the way. I'm being honest. This is the only real technical. So if you guys get lost right now, the whole class is not going to be like an Aristotle discussion or a philosophy discussion. I'm not about that stuff. But the, basically what we find is that when the soul inclines towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the body is at peace too, right? Right? In the sense that if one of them is happy, the other one is happy too. So if you have a bad dream at night, a nightmare at night, and this is what's really amazing about us as human beings. Two people can be sleeping in the same bed, and one of them has a good dream, one of them has a bad dream. When you wake up, is your body affected by what you saw? Yeah, it is. Like if, if you ever, like there are some people, you might, you might dream of yourself getting stabbed by somebody. And you wake up and you'll actually feel like you were stabbed. Because although the soul was the primary recipient of that dream, of that vision, the body feels the effect, you're depressed, you're down, you feel sulky, right? You're, you're in a gloomy mood because, because of what your soul witnessed at night. Whereas the other person, they were both sleeping in the same bed. The other person had a good dream and the other person feels like a million bucks, right? They feel good, they feel energetic, right? When you, and and Rasulullah connected the two. Rasulullah said that when a person prays Fajr, right? When they wake up on time and they pray Fajr, and you know, they do wudu right, ahsan al wudu, they do their wudu right, and they do their fajr good. Asbaha tayyib al nafs nasheed. He wakes up with a good soul, nasheed, energetic. You're naturally energetic for the whole day. Like I was telling these guys, I went to the beach there, I sat in the ocean for like an hour, and I feel like I could pick up this building. Like you just feel good, subhanAllah, your soul is at peace, your body's at peace then, naturally. But it's not the same vice versa. Meaning if the body is satisfied, the soul is miserable if it's deprived of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's really subhanAllah very interesting. Now when we talk about happiness in this world and what gives you happiness in this world, then Imam Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah also said something very powerful. He said that the extent of which everything gives you happiness in dunya is the same extent of misery that it will give you to. Think about it. Money. Money makes you happy. Money also makes you lose friends. It also gives you hem, right responsibility. It also keeps you up at night. You start worrying about your bank accounts. You start worrying about how you're spending that money. You have money, whether it's halal or haram. The amount of money that you have, the amount of happiness that yields you is the same amount of misery that it's going to yield you to. Right? Now haram, obviously, when it's something that's forbidden, you get drunk, yeah, it feels good in the beginning, but it's going to yield you the same, the, the same amount of misery when you have your hangover. Right, or whatever you did while you were while you were while you were drunk. Okay? Even in a halal thing too. Children, how many of you have kids here? Not many of you do, right? You have kids here? Kids make you happy, right? Do they also make you sad? Yeah. <laughs> that same subhanAllah and, and and they play with your emotions, right? When my daughter turned two and I didn't understand what terrible twos mean. And she had that demonic cry where it's like you really think that your child was possessed. Then I realized that all two year olds cry like that. And it's just like, you, you, you want to pull your hair out. And then the minute that they go to sleep and you see them sleeping in that peace, you're just like, I can't wait till she wakes up to play with it. And then like a minute ago, I was like, just go to sleep, please, fall asleep. You know, just, just give me a break for tonight. But subhanAllah, the extent of happiness they give you, even in halal, is the same extent of sadness that they're going to give you. That's the way the dunya works. And you can, you can apply that example to absolutely everything. How many of you guys are going to be doing med school? <laughs> Medical school? Medical school doesn't make you very happy, right? <laughs> but inshallah, it will make you happy eventually. They just, they just switch it around from med school. You become miserable first, and then you get happy afterwards. Which is fine. But you're still on call, and you still got to do some other stuff too. So everything that gives you happiness also gives you sadness. Now, I asked a question, and that question is on the five, three questions. You're going to answer those questions again, inshallah, afterwards, because I want to see how your perspective changes. Uh, one of the questions that I asked was, is having a big home a component of happiness? What do you guys think? Raise your hand if you think yes. Having a, what was the, what was the exact question? The exact wording of the question? Is having a big house or a nice car? Is having a big house or a nice car a means of happiness? Raise your hand if you think yes. Don't give me what you think should be the answer. Give me what you think. If you think yes, raise your hand. If you think no, raise your hand. All right, most of you think no. All right, who wants to be the spokesperson for the yes people? Go ahead, sister. 
gives you space and comfort. Spokesperson for the no people? Anyone? For the no people just want to... Yeah, because yeah, you can't take it with you. You can't take it with you when you die, right? Now, the answer is actually yes. But I'll explain to you why there's a hadith for them. And it's a hadith that's in Muslim of Imam Ahmed. It's an authentic hadith. Rasulullah said, Arba'atu min as There are four things that yield happiness. And this is a phenomenal hadith. And don't, don't judge the hadith before I explain it. That's what a lot of times people do. Sometimes I'm giving the khutbah and when I mention some of these hadith, people are like, they get really upset. Just listen to the hadith and hold, let's talk about it. Arba'atu min as There are four components of happiness. Rasulullah said, Al-Maskan al a spacious home. Was zawjatul saliha, and a good spouse. Okay? And the Prophet said, Wal jar al hasan, a good neighbor. And Rasulullah said, Wal marku al hani, which literally translates into a sweet ride. I'm not even making that up. Markab is ride, hani is sweet. So Rasulullah said a sweet ride. Rasulullah said those four things are components of happiness. And he said, well, arba'atum in the And there are four components of misery. And he basically gave the opposite. Okay? al maskan al a very closed, a very, very small house or one that's suffocating. He actually didn't use small, he used the word suffocating. That's important, I'll talk about why. Layyib, it makes a, people, a person feel like they're being suffocated. A bad spouse. Okay? A bad neighbor and a bad car or a bad ride. Okay? Al-Marqab al Okay, so a bad ride. Now, this hadith is phenomenal because the Prophet, number one, he's acknowledging that having, look, if you drive a car that's not going to break down on you, okay, every, every month or so, and doesn't need to go to the mechanic all the time, right, and, and it doesn't give you trouble. You're naturally going to probably have better days than a person who's driving, you know, a 1960s car that keeps on breaking down and he keeps taking it to a Muslim mechanic and keeps on getting <laughs> more issues than when you first took it there. <laughs> that's, that's a joke, by the way. There's some honest Muslim mechanics. But you get the point, like, okay, you're naturally going to have a happier life. If you have a good spouse, life is naturally a lot easier than someone who doesn't have a good spouse. If you've got a neighbor who's you know, looking out for you, you're exchanging gifts all the time, you're giving sweets to each other, whatever it is, you watch each other's back, when, you, when, everyone's, when the other person is gone, you're naturally going to be doing better. If you have a bigger house, a more spacious house, whereas someone who might live in, you know, in, 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 in something really, really, really small, okay, you're naturally, your mood is probably going to be better, right? But the Prophet ﷺ also makes a very important point, and the Prophet ﷺ tells them, or the Prophet ﷺ demonstrates with his life, this point, your happiness should not depend on any of those things. Because did the Prophet ﷺ have a spacious house? No. Did the Prophet ﷺ have a good wife? Yes. Okay, Ummahat al-Mu'mineen. So that's one. Did the Prophet ﷺ have a good neighbor? Not really. Okay. Did the Prophet ﷺ have a good ride? No. The Prophet ﷺ didn't have any nice camels or you know, nice horses or anything of that sort. The Prophet that was one of the things that they mocked about. Right? The Prophet was driving a camel version of a 1981 Corolla. Alright? That was the Prophet was driving. Okay? Without power steering. Okay? That's that it wasn't it wasn't good. It wasn't necessarily something nice. So the Prophet only had one fourth of those things. But would you say that the Prophet was a happy person? Yes. He was a happy person. Right? Because his sa'ada, his happiness did not depend on those things. Okay? It did not depend on those things. And that's the idea here. When you depend on those things and when you get attached, the key word here is attached. So you talk about attachments. Okay? And this is where misery comes. Alright? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says attachments can actually become a form of shirk. They can actually become a form of polytheism. Not that a person is a mushrik or a person is a disbeliever if they have an attachment to something other than Allah. But Allah says in Surah Al-Baqarah, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَتَّخِذُ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ أَنْدَادًا يُحِبُّونَهُمْ كَحُبِّ اللَّهِ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَشَدُّ حُبًّا لِلَّهِ 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and from the people that have taken partners besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they love those things as they should be loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the believers love Allah more than they love those things. Okay, the believers love Allah more than they love those things. Where's Brother Munir? What ayah is that? I'm not, I want to pull like a little Zachary Nye thing right here. It's like 130, something like that. Somewhere in the 130s, right? First what? First quarter. The first quarter of Al-Baqarah? No, it's not. <laughs> it's not the first quarter. Anyway, somewhere in the 100s. I'll get it at the break and show. Okay? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says they love those things like they should be loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is what the scholars call shirk al mahabba The shirk of love. Literally, the polytheism of love. When you love something like you should be loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Allah also makes another, Allah makes a statement. Allah says those who love Allah though, they love Allah more than those people love those things. Okay, because at the end of the day, no matter what you're attached to, Whenever you perceive that it's not giving you as much happiness, or you get sick of that, or, or whatever it is, you're going to give that thing up and you'll get attached to something else. Right? But with Allah Azza wa Jalla, a, a person who finds Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never goes back. Right? It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes it in Surah Ibrahim. أَلَمْ تَرَ كَيْنَ ضَرَبَ اللَّهُ مَثَلًا كَلِمَةً طَيِّبَةً كَشَجَرَةٍ طَيِّبَةً أَصْلُهَا ثَابَتْ وَفَرْعُهَا فِي السَّمَاءِ تُؤْتِي أُكُلَهَا كُلَّ حِينَ بِإِذْنِ رَبِّهَا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, have you seen the example of a good word, which is la ilaha illallah. It's like a tree, it's, and, and particularly the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa compared it to what tree? Palm tree. Okay. Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu narrates, one time the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked, which tree is like the tree of Iman? It's not a palm tree, because again, you guys don't have real palm trees. There's a palm tree in Medina, if you go try to shake a palm tree in Medina, I don't care if you're a bodybuilder, you're not going to move that tree. That tree is firm, right? A real palm tree is firm. It doesn't move. And that's one of the miracles of Maryam. Alayhi salam. When Allah told her to push the palm tree. You don't push a palm tree. Nothing happens to a palm tree and you push it. But it's a miracle from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala compared it to a firm. It's firm in the heart. Asluha thabit. It's planted very firm. Its foundation is solid. Wa farruha sama. Its branches are all are, are high in the sky. It's consistently giving fruit. It's not a seasonal tree, right? Like a palm tree in Medina. No matter what, you, when you go to Umrah, when you go to Hajj, you're always going to have fresh dates. Because palm trees are always producing fresh dates. Do your trees do that over here? All right. <laughs> it's always producing fresh, fresh, fresh dates. Allah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making a statement here. When is the last time you found an apostate who was a scholar? Or who was a da'i? Or who was someone that used to always go to the masjid, right? Not go to the masjid because they were forced or because of culture, or they jumped in because they had a, a traumatic moment in their lives and they jumped back out. You know, how many priests do you see come to Islam? All the time, right? You see priests come, in fact, you know, when someone starts to speak ill of a good Christian, I'm like, don't do that because I'm telling you, a good Christian, a sincere Christian usually ends up at Islam if they're exposed properly, right? Usually they'll end up at Islam. So you'll find people that will be rabbis, you can go search them online, Google them if you want to, whatever it is, you'll find rabbis, you'll find priests, you'll find people of other faiths that will accept Islam happily, right? And in large numbers. When's the last time you found someone, it's not because we're afraid of being killed, okay? It's, we're even in the West, right? When's the last time you found an imam of, a, of, of stature leaving Islam? Or, you know, someone who was known for a strong faith. Why? Because once you develop an attachment to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, yeah, your iman will wither, you know, in the sense that sometimes it'll be up, sometimes it'll be down, but there's a foundation there. And it'll always be producing something, like there, there are intangibles, there are things that you don't give up. Right, like even as a Muslim, you know, I'm not feeling too good, I'm, I'm not, obviously I'm not having the same amount of iman that I have in a lecture, in a conference, or in a class, or whatever it is. But you know what, I'm still holding on to my prayers, I'm still holding on to those things, I'm just not praying as much nawafin, for example, as much voluntary prayers, I'm not as... As, you know, I'm not having as much of an iman rush, right? But I still have it there, it's firm, it's solid. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, those who love Allah, those who have that attachment to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ashaddu hubban lillah. Their love is so much stronger than anyone else's love to anything else. Now, the idea here, and this is really, there are two beautiful verses. The first one is Surah Al-Ankabut, and it's verse 41. Surah Al-Ankabut, verse 41. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, 
مَثَلُ الَّذِينَ تَخَذُوا مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ أَوْلِيَاء The example of those who take awliya. The word wali means a protective friend. Sometimes Allah uses the word andad, which means God, aliha, right? Deities. Allah uses awliya. A wali is a protective friend. Okay? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, those who took besides Allah protective friends, meaning they took their gods as protective friends. They, they trusted them, they put all of their love to them, they put all of their trust in them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, كَمَثَلِ الْعَنْكَبُوتِ It's like a spider. اتَّخَذَتْ بَيْتًا And the spider constructed its home. Now, when you look at a spider, a spider's web, is a spider web strong? Is a spider web strong or is a spider web weak? Now, the, 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 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, well, the, the, the weakest home is a spider's web, right? But, is a spider web strong to some creatures? Yes. Yeah, like which creatures? Mosquitoes, flies, whatever it is, right? Like Spider-Man doesn't exist, you guys thought he did. <laughs> you don't get human beings like that, they get caught up in it, literally. But, seriously speaking, the spider's web is an amazing creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know why? The tensile strength of a spider web, the strength of a spider web, is actually stronger than steel. It has more strength than steel. But, what happens when a wind blows? So if you're caught in a spider's web, you're not getting out. Right? A, a, a bug that's caught in a spider's web is not... Have you ever seen a mosquito get out of a spider? No, it's not happening. <laughs> Once you're caught, you're caught. Right? But, the spider's web itself as a whole is still weak. Because some wind blows, spider web blows, you open your door and there's a spider web there, a spider web tears apart. Right? The itsy bitsy spider. The water came, right? Went up the water sprout, down came the water. Is that how it goes? Wash the spider out, right? It's not gonna, subhanAllah, it's not gonna hold. Now why is Allah using this example? Because when you're caught into something, when you're attached to something, you can't see the world outside of that attachment. It's in, in its nature, it's extremely weak. There's nothing really strong about it. But you have enslaved yourself to it. And you've gotten so attached to it, you don't see the world outside of it anymore. Right? I'll give you an example. Someone establishes a relationship with someone that they're not supposed to, or they do it with improper means, with unlawful means. Then three years later, they come and they tell their parents, and they say, let's get married. And there's some obstacles that happen and stuff like that. And then instead of opting to stay with the family, you know, guy and girl run away, they get married, you know, forget about the parents. Why? Because I can't live without her. I can't live without her. That's a, that's a myth. That's in your head. That's all psychological. You were living fine without that person, right? Three years ago. In fact, your life was a lot better. There was a lot less crying, a lot less you know emotions, a lot less trauma. You were doing fine. Your your family was on good terms with you, right? But when you're caught, you're caught. I can't see outside of this. I can't imagine my life outside of this, right? Subhanallah. You look at some people that came from overseas, lived very 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 simple lives. Right, extremely simple lives. But whenever they got here, got used to money, got used to living a certain lifestyle, and then when they have a little bit of a financial crunch, just a little bit, right? They think life is gonna end. I can't see life without it. Right? It's like us, whenever our phones break, we just become depressed, pitiful human beings, don't we? Like, if I don't have a phone, I can't like, like we're so attached, we're so into, like, smile up. You, it, it's crazy, because people are sitting around, and while you're sitting in a room, everybody's checking their Facebook, everyone's checking their Twitter, everyone's checking their emails. We're addicted. You're attached. But you know how much happier like, your life would be if you weren't attached? Right? But you can't see outside of it. I can't imagine my life without... Just put your phone aside for three days. Give yourself a vacation from your phone. Give yourself a vacation from social media and from text messaging. And go to the beach. After Fajr. Alright? <laughs> They'll take that as a recommendation, like show up there on South Beach at 3 o'clock and say, well, Chef said that I have to go to the beach. <laughs> I'll do that, all right? I'm talking about just, just, just up, take a break, right? Take a break, and you know what, wow, life is actually pretty good with us. But when you're caught, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you're so caught, you're just like that bug that's in that spider's web. SubhanAllah. And that's why the surah is named the Ankabut. 
right? The scholars of Tafsir, they said, look at this, like the entire surah, there's only one verse that talks about a spider's web. That's it. But from the beginning to the end, what is the first ayah of Surah Al-Ankabut? Alif la mim ahasib al-nas wa an yutraku an yakulu amanna wa hum la yuftanun. Allah subhanahu wa says, do people think that, that they just say we believe and then Allah, they, they, and then Allah subhanahu wa leaves them alone and He doesn't test them? And Allah says, وَلَقَدْ فَتَنَّ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ We tested the people before you. فَلَيَعْلَمَنَّ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا فَلَيَعْلَمَنَّ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ صَدَقُوا وَلَيَعْلَمَنَّ الْكَاذِبِينَ So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows through that who is truthful in their faith and who is lying in their faith, who is not truthful in their faith. The idea here, what is a test in and of itself? Right? Allah Azza wa tells us in Surah Al-Baqarah, وَلَنَبْلُوَنَّكُمْ بِشَيْءٍ مِنَ الْخَوْفِ وَالْجُوعِ وَنَقْصٍ مِنَ الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَنْفُسِ وَالْثَمَرَاتِ وَبَشِّرِ الصَّابِرِينَ You know, we're, you're going to be tested with some anxiety, you're going to be tested with, with some, some diminishing of your health, diminishing of your wealth. These things, right, will be taken away from you. By doing that, Allah purifies you of having any other attachments. Any other and that. So the entire surah is named after this one ayah because of how profound that example and that analogy is. Right? Because when you're caught, you're caught. And that's why if we look at in Surah Al Duha, we look at what the Prophet was put through. And subhanAllah, it's absolutely amazing. The Prophet was an orphan. Right? His mother died. I mean, his, his father died before he was born, Ali Salatu Sam, and his mother when he was only six. The Prophet ﷺ never really enjoyed financial prosperity, right? The Prophet ﷺ basically gained what he gained through character and reputation from his wife Khadija to his status in society, all the nicknames. Then, whenever Islam came, all of that was taken away temporarily. Right? For a few years, he became the most humiliated person in society. He was persecuted, he had no family to take care of him. Even Abu Talib, his uncle, was taken away from him. Khadija, his wife, was taken away from him. Everything was taken away from him. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted the Prophet to only be attached to him. And that's why Surah Al Duha, Wa Duha wa Layli ila Saja. Ma wa da'aka rabbuka wa ma qala. Don't think that your Lord has abandoned you or left you. Right? Your Lord, they used to say, Qad qala Muhammad, you know, Rabba Muhammad. Muhammad s.a.w.'s Lord has left him. Allah says, don't think that. Don't think that Allah has left you. But what was Allah doing? Breaking all of His attachments. Didn't Allah find you as an orphan? And Allah found you looking for guidance. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala found you poor. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you wealth. Allah found you in all these things. Allah is reminding the Prophet of His favors upon him. Why? So now, number one, for your own self, you've broken attachments. You don't depend on anyone but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You enjoy a certain level of tawakkul, a certain level of trust and reliance upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And now when you see other people in the same situation, what are you going to do? You're going to remember. Right? Now when you see an orphan, you know what to do. You see someone asking, you know what to do. Right? You've tested that. You've tried that. Allah tried you. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala broke all of those spider webs. Allah did away with, with them so that the Prophet Sallallahu trust was purely in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And again, it breaks the attachment. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says in Surah Al-Hajj, if I'm talking too fast, let me know, okay? I have a tendency to talk too fast. Alright, just let me know if you need some, some, uh, some clarification on it. Surah Al-Hajj, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says that the example of those who took awliya besides Allah, again, the same thing, those who took protectors instead of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and it's ayah number 31, those who, or 32, 31, those who took protectors besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Listen to this example that Allah gives us. It's like this person was dropped from the skies, was dropped in midair. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, So a bird picks him up. Right, a bird swoops him up and takes him somewhere and drops him and he finds himself He finds himself in a lost and abandoned place, meaning he doesn't know where he is. Now think about this. Again, an example of attachments. Okay? And the ayah before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, the ayah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, Khalafat, those people who are who are who worship Allah alone, Mukhlisina Lahuddin with true sincerity upon fitrah, then Allah is giving us this example. A person gets picked up by a bird, 
Right? And just imagine this example of how powerful it is. And the bird takes him wherever the bird's going to take him. And then the bird drops him. And you know what happens to a person who's already been emotionally vulnerable, who's already gotten attached to someone and then had that attachment shattered? What happens to that person? They're insecure. I need another attachment. I need something else to come pick me up. Another bird picks you up, takes you somewhere all over the place, and then that bird drops you. Another bird picks you up and drops you. And then at the end, you find yourself lost. Makan and sahih, abandoned and lost. You don't know where you are. You don't know how you reach that position. And that's when shaitan tries to get you to despair. That's when shaitan tries to get you to be hopeless because shaitan tries to make you think there's no turning back to Allah. There's no way this is all going to get fixed. That's it. Okay, so again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, those who take protected friends besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the next category, needs versus wants. Now I know this is usually an economic discussion, right? Needs versus wants. But it's very powerful because many times you'll find that when you feel like you need something, Allah's not giving it to you. I'm making dua for it, I'm asking for it, I want this, I need this, I need this in my life, right? Like sometimes, like especially attachments are usually to people. Attachments are usually to people, right? Sometimes you say to a person, why don't you pray istikhara? You know, an istikhara, you're not going to see any dreams, you're not going to put any Quran in water, it's not, it just means that Allah is either going to make things easier for you, or make things harder for you. If it's good for you, He'll make it easier for you. If it's harder for you, He'll put obstacles, right? So why don't you pray istikhara about this person? And I remember, subhanAllah, there's two people that's happened to me. I was telling them, I, I was giving them the dua of istikhara from the sunnah, right, the supplication that should be said. And from the supplication, what are you asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? If it's good for me, fi dini, wa dunyai, if it's good for me, my deen, and my, my dunya, and my living, and for my family, for my wealth, if it's good for me, okay, then, yes, you know, yes, hali, make it easy for me. Right? And if it's bad for me, make it hard for me. So I was like, why don't you pray istikhara? And two times people responded by saying, well, I don't want to pray istikhara because I want that person. Right? It's not a matter of. <laughs> If it's bad for me, I want a lot. Of, I don't want a lot to take it away from me. Even if it's bad for me, because I'm attached, right? I, I, I want it. But what you're really saying when you say I want it is I need it. I can't live without it. And Subhanallah, what you find is that sometimes when people break that attachment, then Allah Subhanahu wa Taala gives it to them, right? Someone says, I need this job. I need this. I need this. I need this. I need this. I want this. I want this. Then after the person has developed, you know, or, or a person has just gotten over it, Allah gives it to them. Why is that? And I want you to pay very close attention to this. And Imam Ibn Al-Qayyim Rahimullah said something very powerful. He said that sometimes Allah will not give you what you want because you feel like you need it. Once you have converted the need to a want, Allah gives it to you. <laughs> SubhanAllah. Once you've converted the need to the want to a want, Allah gives it to you. Why? Because it's no longer something that's affecting your iman, it's no longer something that's affecting your faith. You're no longer so attached to it that you're not going to get anywhere in life. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it easy for you. Right? And I've seen it countless times. Right? People are all caught up worshipping their education, worshipping you know, a certain person in essence, or a relationship with a certain person, or worshipping some kind of position. And they're so into it and involved that once they develop their relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more and they treat that thing moderately, if it's good for me, it'll happen, inshallah. If it's not good for me, then, you know, that's fine. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives it to them. Right? To show you that you didn't need it. That's the idea. You did not need it to be happy. And we have to come to that understanding. We have to come to that conclusion. Um, how much time do we have left in this session? Because I don't want to go to the last point here unless... Should we take a, can we take a break now and then just start up the next session? After five minutes? Five minute break or ten minutes? You guys don't deserve a ten minute break. We just started. <laughs> can we, we'll just take a five minute break just this time. Okay? We'll do a ten minute break from here on out. We just, we just got started. So inshallah, we'll take a five minute break. If that's okay with the organizers. Five minutes means five minutes. I know you guys have a hard time. Okay, so the next thing, uh, the next topic here, which is the last part of the slide, is a very, very, very profound hadith. It's one of my favorite hadith from the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And I want you to imagine this. This, is a, this hadith is an advice 
that Jibreel السلام, is giving to the Prophet وسلم, outside of his capacity of revelation. Okay, I'm going to say that again. Jibreel giving advice to the Prophet وسلم, outside his capacity of revelation. The hadith is narrated in Muslim Imam Ahmad and in Sifsa Sahihah. It's, it's an authentic hadith, highest chain of authenticity. And listen to this. Jibreel السلام, says to the Prophet. وسلم, Ya Muhammad. Ya Muhammad. Now, what is different about the way Jibreel is addressing the Prophet here? He always says Ya Rasulullah. Allah always says Ya Rasulullah. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses him as Rasulullah. Jibreel addresses him as Rasulullah. But here he chooses to say Ya Muhammad. Now, there's two things that come out of this by him saying Ya Muhammad. Number one, he's letting him know what? Huh? That this is outside of revelation. This is not Quran. This is not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaking to you. This is me, Jibreel. Okay? Number two, it's like a maw'idah, heart to heart advice, right? And what a beautiful advice. Think about this. It's from. The best of the angels. Like think about this conversation that's taking place here. Sayyidul Malaika. The best of the angels was Sayyidul Basar wal Khalq. And the best of human beings in all of creation. And they're having a conversation. And he says to the Prophet I'm going to give you some advice. He says, Ya Muhammad, Isma shit fa'inna kamayyid. He gives them five advices. The first one, he says, live as long as you want, but you're going to die eventually. Live as you will, but you're going to die. <laughs> Meaning what? No matter what you try to establish in this life, and no matter what you go through, and no matter what you build in this life, eventually, you're dead. Right? <laughs> As Allah says, you are dead, and they are all dead. No matter what. Right? And that's why the Prophet ﷺ acted upon that advice very wisely. When the Prophet ﷺ said, كُنْ فِي الدُّنْيَا كَأَنَّكَ غَرِيبٌ أَوْ عَابِرَ سَبِيلٌ Be in this world as if you're a stranger or a wayfarer. Right? And he also said, the example of, of me in this dunya, and the akhirah is like a traveler that's passing, he takes a rest under the shade of a tree. Then he moves on. Okay? And, and um, Abdullah ibn Umar عنه, was the rawi of this hadith, the narrative of this hadith. He says that in the morning, don't expect to live till the evening. And in the evening, don't expect to live till the morning. You know, subhanAllah, there's a very powerful statement I once heard. That said, live life like a cancer patient. Live life like a cancer patient. If everyone lived life like a cancer patient, everything would be great. Why? Because when a person is a cancer patient, and they're, they're in the last stages, and you know, they don't, you know, doctor said you've got two months or three months or whatever it is, then what happens? Naturally, all the relationships are, you know, are brought back together. Reconciliation, priorities. Everything is put in proper perspective because you understand you're about to go anyway. Right? So you don't want to die having those, having those issues. So again, the first advice, live as, as you will, but you're going to die. Live life like a cancer patient. Treat people as if you're never going to see them again. Treat your life as, treat your salah as if it's your last salah, right? The, qual, the key to the quality of salah is as the Prophet ﷺ told us, Salu salat and wada. Pray as if this is the last time you're going to stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The last time, you know, in this dunya that you're going to get to speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, you pray as if it's your last prayer. You treat people as if it's the last time you'll see them. So you don't go to bed angry, they tell you, right? So that solves a lot of anxiety issues. You, re, you, you make sure that all your debts are paid off. You make sure that everything's taken care of if you understand that you're going to die anyway. It puts life in perspective. And that's why when the Prophet وسلم, when the time of death came to him, Jibreel made him, the same one who was giving him this advice, Jibreel السلام, made him an offer. He said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you one of two options. Either you can go and be, and be in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the presence of the Divine, or, you can live as long as the rest of mankind. You'll be immortal until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes everyone back, including the angel of death. Until everyone dies, including the angel of death. And the Prophet ﷺ responded, 
rather the high company, the high presence of the divine presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The greater friend, the higher friend. And the Prophet repeated that until he died. I want Allah's company. Why? Because again, this is for those of you that are coming in late, advice Jibreel gives to the Prophet outside of the capacity of revelation. The first one. Live as you will, but you're going to die. The second one. Love whom you will, but you're going to depart from that person. Eventually your relationship will be broken. Okay? This is something now, now there are two things that we take from this. Number one, to prioritize your relationships. <laughs> to prioritize your relationships. Right? A lot of times we, we put and I, and I was sharing this with some, with some brothers actually today on the way here. SubhanAllah, I was sharing this the most powerful advice I've ever received from, from Shaykh Umar al Ashqaq rahimahullah ta'ala. And he said that, make sure you keep your old friends. He was speaking to me particularly, he said, because you know, now that you're a public figure, then you don't know who's befriending you because of that, or who's befriending you because they really love you. But at least you know from your old friends that they love you because they love you. Prioritize your relationships, right? So it might not always be a sweet, with my brother, my older brother, fight all the time, you know, we don't really exchange courtesies or things of that sort, right? Or, of course, we do now, but I mean, growing up, we don't really do that. But at the same time, I know that he loves me, I know he's looking out for me, because it's someone that's, that's loved me for a very long time. So you prioritize your relationships, your parents, right? A lot of times, someone comes into your life that excites you, that excites you. Again, spider's web. It's weak on the out, it, it truly is weak, but it excites you. Right, you've only known this person for less than a year and you're willing to throw away a relationship that's existed for 25 years. Right, or 20 years, just throw it away out the window because it's not as exciting right now. Even though that's solid, that is solid, but this is not solid. Right, so Jibreel is telling the Prophet and at the same time, you're not going to be able to take the relationship with any human being with you to the grave because at the end of the day, the only relationship that truly matters on the Day of Judgment is your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So don't become so attached to people that you forget your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in fact, even with loving righteous people and loving people that you're supposed to, you know, Umar al-Khattab of the Allah who narrates, says, لا يكون حبك كلفة Don't let your love be too much and don't let your hate be too much. Because the person that you love too much might one day stab you in the back and become your enemy. And the person that you hate might end up being your best friend. Right? So don't be excessive in loving and don't be excessive in hating. Right? Keep your love tempered, your hate tempered. You know? Keep it down. Because you don't want to get attached. And sometimes, subhanAllah, when you hate someone so much, you get attached to hating that person. Your whole life is dictated by how much you hate that person, right? You let that, you let that control your day about the misery of that person or what you want to be the misery of that person dictates the way that you live that day or that where you live your life. And there's one also very powerful um, hadith that's narrated by Ibn Hibban, also by Ibn Kathir and Ahmad about Abdullah ibn Salam. Abdullah ibn Salam radiallahu ta'ala anhu was one of the great Jewish rabbis in Medina who accepted Islam. Okay? And became a great scholar in Islam. And after the Prophet passed away, he was one of the last Sahaba to live. He lived a very long time with the Allah Ta'ala. Um, once there was a group of people that saw him walk into the masjid and he prayed. And some of the people, they, you know, some of the Sahaba, they told the Tabi'in that Rasulullah said, that this man is a man from Jannah. That this is a person of paradise. Right? This person is surely a person of paradise. So this Tabi'i, who I think is Qais ibn Abbad, Qais ibn Abbad rahimahullah, I think that's him. He said, I followed Abdullah ibn Salam, and I told him that people said this about you. And the first thing Abdullah ibn Salam said, is he responded by saying, Subhanallah, لا ينبغي للناس أن يقولوا ما لا يعلم. لا ينبغي لأحد أن يقول ما لا يعلم. That it's not befitting for a person to say what he doesn't know. Only Allah knows from a person of paradise at the end of the day. But he told, he told Qais the situation in which the Prophet ﷺ told him that you're a man of Jannah. He said that I have a dream, and in that dream, I I was in a garden, a very big garden, Arulba, right? And in the middle of that garden. 
in the middle of that garden, there was a pole. I moved to a pole. So he said, I went to that pole, and I was told to climb that pole, and I said, I don't know how, I can't climb this pole, and then something blew me from under, and it blew me up that pole. And on the top of that pole, there was a handhold. Urwa, there was a handhold. So I grabbed onto it, and I felt stability. Holding on to that, I felt pure, I felt completely stable, even in, in midair, because I was holding on to that urwa, to that handhold. So I woke up and I told the Prophet about that dream. And the Prophet said, He says, As for the garden, it is the garden of Islam, and the pole it is the pole of Islam, and the urwa is an urwa to wuthqa, which is the steady handhold. Allah calls it the steady handhold in the Quran. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah wa ladina amin. Yukhrijuhum ya qurumati ila nur. Allah is the protector of those who believe. And this is the ayah after, well, the second ayah after ayat al kursi. Okay? And Surah Al Baqarah. Number? Okay, we'll figure out the number. Just ayat al kursi right after. Allah is the protected friend of those who believe. Yukhrijuhum ya qurumati ila nur. He takes them out from darkness. Upon darkness, upon darkness to light. Burumat is darknesses, which isn't a word in English, by the way. Okay? Darkness upon darkness upon darkness, Allah takes them out of that and He brings them to a nur, clarity, light. Okay? And those who disbelieve their awliya are ta'bud. Their protective friends are anything but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Things that they, that they set up as partners besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَالَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا أَوْلِيَاءُ مُطَابُوتِ يُخْرِجُونَهُمْ مِنَ نُورِ إِلَى الظُّلْمَاتِ They take those people from light to darkness upon darkness upon darkness. أُولَٰئِكَ أَصْحَابُ النَّارِ هُمْ فِيهَا قَالِدُونَ Verily, those are the people of, of hellfire, and they will reside therein forever. I think I actually went before, after it, I went to the Lord. لَا إِكْرَهَا فِيهِمْ فَتَّبَيْنَ الرُّشْتُ مِنَ الْلَائِمِ Okay, the ayah after ayah of Kursi. Which is right before explaining that wilayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that there is no compulsion in religion. Truth stands clear from falsehood. So the one who abandons, and Allah did not say, because in order to have it, Allah quit. Abandons all partners besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and believes in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, affirms that belief in Allah. Because in order to have true belief in Allah, you've got to break attachment, the protective relationship that you have, the protective friends, not friends as in human beings, but it could become a point of worship. But you know, anything that you worship besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's why La ilaha illallah is not there is only one God, it's a statement of negation. There is nothing worthy of worship and unconditional obedience besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they break them. And then, وَيُؤْمِنْ بِاللَّهِ فَقَدْ إِسْلَمْسَكَ بِالْعُرْوَةِ الْوُثْقَى Then they grabbed onto the steady handhold. لَنْ فِي صَامَ لَهَا وَاللَّهُ سَمِيرَ عَلِيمٌ That steady handhold will not let a person wither. A person who's holding on to that. A person finds, finds tranquility. A person finds stability in their life by holding on to that. And that is the handhold of Iman. Right? Literally imagine yourself on top of a pole holding on to a handhold. You're with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nothing affects you from under anymore. Right? In terms of attachments. You don't get attached to anything else. And in order to achieve that, you've got to break all the attachments. So Jibreel tells the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi what? You guys already forgot? <laughs> What's that? <laughs> The second one? Yeah, look at your notes. Love whom you will, you're going to depart from that person. The relationship will be broken. You know? And then the next thing, Jibreel tells to the Prophet Do what you want, but you're going to be repaid, compensated for what you've done. Meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows you to act as you will. Right? Go ahead and act. Do what you want. But you are going to only find on the Day of Judgment what you have done. On the Day of Judgment, Allah, and this is the, the, the most important aspect of qadr, of understanding divine decree. Oh, but Allah leads people astray. Allah does this. On the Day of Judgment, Allah is not going to show you Allah al the tablet with Him. And Allah is not going to show you the record of the angels. 
Allah will show you your books and your deeds. Right? It's what we've done. On the Day of Judgment, you see what you've done. Nothing else. Allah doesn't exaggerate them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not blow them up. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will show you exactly what you've done. Your deeds as you did them, committed. There you go. Read. Right? It's your deeds. So Jibreel is telling the Prophet because we have an understanding that again, happiness is not just in dunya, it's in akhirah too. We're talking about gaining happiness. It can't just be a worldly thing. We want to be happy in dunya too. What's the point? Um, you know, being happy only in dunya and then being miserable in akhir. Right? So, Allah says, so Jibreel is telling the Prophet وَعَمَلْ مَا شِئْتْ فَإِنَّكَ مَجْزِيًا بِهِ Do whatever you want, but you're going to be compensated. Right? As Ibn al-Jawzi said, دَا دَارَ لِلْمَرْهِ بَعْنِ الْمَوْتِ يَسْكُنُهَا إِلَّا لَتِي كَانَ قَبْلَ الْمَوْتِ يَبْنِيهَا There will be no home for a person to live in in the hereafter, except for the one he's, he constructed in dunya. Right? You have construction materials in dunya, and in hereafter, you're only going to live in that house. So Jibreel is telling the Prophet وَعْمِلْ مَا شِئْتْ فَإِنَّكَ مَرْزِيًا بِهِ So the first three advices, I want you to memorize this hadith. First one. عِشْ مَا شِئْتْ فَإِنَّكَ مَيِّتْ Live as you will, but you're going to die. Second one. وَحْبِلْ مَا شِئْتْ فَإِنَّكَ مُفَارِقُ Love who you will, but you're going to depart from that person. The third one. You can say it in English too, it's okay. Alright. Some of you are trying to mumble like a few Arabic words and you're stuck. It's okay. وَعْمَلْ مَا شِئْتْ فَإِنَّكَ مَجْزِيُّ مِنْ Do what you want, but you're going to be compensated likewise. Okay? You're going to be compensated for what you've done. Now listen to the last two advices. وَعْلَمْ أَنَّ شَرَفَ الْمُؤْمِنْ قِيَامُهُ بِاللَّيْلِ And know that the nobility of the believer is in his qiyam at night, is in his standing at night. قِيَامُهُ بِاللَّيْلِ وَعْلَمْ أَنَّ شَرْفَ الْمُؤْمِنْ قِيَامُهُ بِاللَّيْهِ وَعِزَّهُ اسْتِغْنَاهُ عَنِ النَّاسِ And his honor is his being independent of people. SubhanAllah, beautiful advice. You take them together. These two advices are very powerful. Number one, your sharaf, your nobility, is when you stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at night invoking Allah alone. That, subhanAllah, gives you so much happiness and it elevates your status. You know, usually when you ask someone, you're naturally degraded, right? You're naturally belittled when you ask people, okay? No matter who you are, just by your very asking, your nobility takes a hit. But with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more you ask Allah, the more noble you are, the more your status increases. And that's, that's the, the authentic hadith of the Prophet Allah. Whoever lowers himself for Allah, Allah raises them, Allah elevates them. Right? Ibn Rajab, Rahimahullah, he said that, I am amazed that people spend their nights at the doors of the kings, at the doors of people of influence, asking, and the one who owns everything, who owns the kingdom of the world, and the kingdom of the heavens, is extending his hand and saying, is there anything that you want? Is there anyone who wants forgiveness that I can give it to? Him? Is there anyone who wants anything? You know, any da' any, anyone who's calling upon Allah so I can answer his dua? The one who is the king of all kings is asking you, what do you want? Right? Comes down to the lowest heaven every single night and asks, what do you want? SubhanAllah. You see how ironic that is? So, so Jibreel is telling the Prophet ﷺ, the sharaf, the nobility of the believer, is asking Allah, standing up at night and asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whenever you have that, whenever you have that, there is a very natural consequence. You know what that is? You have izza, you have dignity, by having, wa izzahu istighnahu an nafs. You don't need people anymore. Now I know that's a very radical statement. And I know that books will say otherwise. In our deen, if a person truly has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the extent that he has Allah is the extent that he doesn't need people anymore. And this isn't just emotionally speaking. Uh, when it comes to finances, obviously, that's, that, that's also important by the way, finances. In Islam, we don't believe poverty is praiseworthy unless Allah puts you through poverty. You don't put yourself through poverty in Islam. Right, there's no such thing as a person who gives up the world and puts themselves in poverty, and that, that makes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala happy with them. It doesn't happen that way. Right? 
But at the same and at the same time, Rasulullah says, The upper hand is always better than the lower hand. And Rasulullah said, The upper hand is the one that's giving, the lower hand is the one that's receiving. Okay, he is that's the one that's asking. Now, that doesn't mean if a person is in poverty, they shouldn't be helped. No, they should be helped. But the but we are encouraged in our deen to try to become self-sufficient financially too. Right? To try to become independent of people financially and emotionally. As independent as possible. Yes, some, having good friends really does lighten up the it really does lighten the heart, it lightens the soul, it makes things easier. But the more a person has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the less they need people. Okay, and actually I'm gonna jump. There's a few slides, but I'm gonna I'm just gonna include it here. Complaining, a shakwa. Okay? The word complaining, a shakwa. Now, uh, how many of you know Iqbal? Know poetry, Urdu poetry. Okay? Now the, the others I remember he, he wrote a poem called Shakwa, which was complaining, and he's complaining, and the scholars were very, very unhappy about that. He's complaining to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then what did he write? Jawab al Shakwa, the answer to my complaints. <laughs> And he wrote another beautiful poem, which is the answer that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave. And then all the scholars were happy with that. <laughs> so it was good, alhamdulillah. It's beautiful stuff, right? And the idea here is that complaining, complaining to Allah is not a bad thing. A shakwa in Allah, complaining to Allah, as Imam ibn al-Qayyim said, is a form of dua. It's actually a form of supplication. But it's the manner in which you complain to Allah. Okay, it's how you complain to Allah which makes it permissible or prohibited. Alright, now let me explain this a little bit. Umar bin Khattab was talking about people who complain to other people. You know how sometimes we just need to vent. I need to vent to somebody. Or I'm going to call somebody and tell them about how miserable my life was for an hour and then I'm going to feel better. Okay? Alright, do it. Call somebody up, call and that person is trying to enjoy a day with their family and you just ruin their day because they've got to sit on the side of the room and listen to you talk about how miserable your life is. Okay, go ahead. Alright? Now, Umar bin Khattab said, لَيْسَ فِي الشَّكْوَةِ إِلَّا تُحْزِنَ صَدِيقَ أَوْ تُشَمِّ تَعَدُوَ There is no good in complaining to people. The only thing you get out of venting out to people, shakwa literally means venting by the way. The only thing you get out of venting to people is you either depress a friend or you make a person that doesn't like you happy. <laughs> Meaning what? If the person likes you, if the person loves you and cares about you, you just brought down their mood. Maybe that person was finally enjoying a good day after a very stressful week or something like that. And you just depress them because of how depressed you are. Or a person doesn't like you, but they're posing it like they do, and you're telling them about how, how miserable you are, and that person's getting happy. They're, they're, they're joyous, at, or they're joyful at your misfortune. Okay? Now, the idea here, now obviously, Umar al-Fatal is like the straight talk express, the real one. Okay? Like he tells it how it is. Okay? Ibn al Qayyim rahimahullah, he further said something very beautiful. He said, when you complain to people all the time, when you're someone that vents all the time to people, he said, man ila man la You complain about the one who has mercy upon you to people who don't have mercy upon you. Meaning what? Because when you're always complaining about how bad life is, you're implying that Allah is not being as merciful with you as He's being to other people. Okay, that's the implication there. But the, the person that you're complaining to, you know what, look, as, as friends, usually, and this is the, beautiful, the beauty of al fi sabilillah, love for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is that there's something intangible there. It's, there's, it's not money between us, it's not, you know, it's, it's nothing like that. It's just love fi sabilillah. We love each other for the sake of Allah, right? But usually the way friends are, is, you know, they, they look at how much they're benefiting from each relationship. Okay, whether it's emotionally or financially, whatever it is. If I'm getting more out of you than you're getting out of me, then we're cool. But when that imbalance becomes too obvious, I'm going to stop answering the phone. Right? If you're consistently calling a person to complain, eventually the person gets sick of you. Right? Eventually the person's going to pick up the phone and go, like, you know, crumple up the, the Walmart bag or whatever it is. You know, oh, I'm in an elevator right now. But you can't really do that now because they've got iPhone, they've got the app for find your friends. It's like, you can't even do that anymore. <laughs> you can't say you're at a place if you're not at and stuff like that. But people don't like to answer the phone anymore. People try to dodge you. People don't want to talk to you anymore. Because you're always needy. 
whether it's emotionally or financially, you just keep on calling. Like, they might have genuinely loved you at one time, but at the same time, like, it just got overboard. Right? So, شَكَوْتَ مَنْ يَرْحَمُكْ إِلَىٰ مَنْ لَا يَرْحَمُكْ And in essence, we find here that there are some people, uh, or that there are some people that are capable of helping you, but they're not willing to help you. And there are some people that are willing to help you, but they're not capable of helping you. Usually you find one of the two. Okay? Like there are rich people in this world that could write you a check that could make you comfortable for the rest of your life. But they're not willing. They're capable, but they're not willing. Whereas on the other hand, your mother would love to write you a check and make your life comfortable for the rest of your life, but she's not capable of doing so. Right? So people are between these two. But Allah is both willing and capable. And the more you call upon Allah, does, does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala start ignoring you? Does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala get sick of you asking? No. In fact, مَنْ لَا يَسْأَلِ اللَّهِ يَقْلَبُ عَلَيْهِ The Prophet says, whoever doesn't ask Allah, Allah becomes upset with him. Why aren't you asking? So the more you ask Allah, the more it pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah is both willing and capable. So whenever you take that to your dua, right, you take that to your supplication, and you're able to call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and vent to Allah, not in a way complaining about why did, not saying, oh Allah, why did you do this? But vent to Allah the way Ya'qub alayhi salam, Jacob vented about Yusuf alayhi salam. Didn't he say, I complain to Allah? Ashku. He said, use the word. Ashku bathi wa huzni Allah. I complain about my stress and my sadness to Allah. I'm not going to complain to you people. I'm going to complain to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I have a relationship with Allah where I can complain to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ashku bathi wa huzni Allah. Zakariya alayhi salam. When he's asking for Yahya, when he's asking for a child, right? Zakariya alayhi salam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِذْ نَادَى رَبَّهُ When he called onto his Lord, like nida, nada nida is like he shouted a shout. He cried a cry. If you hear that, what do you imagine? A lot of, you know, very audible, very loud, right? But then Allah says khafiya. It was actually silence. It was just him in the corner of the masjid making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No one could hear him. He wasn't saying this out loud. Everyone was saying ameen. Called upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Very emotionally, he said to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what did he, what's the first way he started off his dua? How did he start off? كَافَا يَا عِنْ صَادِّكُ رَحْمَةِ رَبِّكَ عَبِدَهُ زَكَرِيَا إِذْ نَادَى رَبَّهُ نِدَاءً خَفِيَا قَالَ رَبِّ إِنِّي وَهْنَ الْعَظْمُ مِنِّي وَاشْتَعَنَ الرَّأْسُ شَيْبًا said, oh Allah, my bones are gone. I'm feeble on the inside. Right? My bones have become old. And my hair has exploded with gray. There's not a single black hair on my head. But you know what? You never let me down before. SubhanAllah, you see the complaints? He's complaining to Allah saying, I'm weak on the inside, I'm weak on the outside, but I know when I call upon you, you take care of me. SubhanAllah, you've never left me deprived. You've never left, and this is a man in his 90s calling for a child. <laughs> and he's so confident in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he trusts Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you never let me down before oh Allah. Ayyub alayhi salam, Ayyub, Jonah, what did he, he went through all kinds of stuff. Did he complain to Allah? Did Jonah complain to Allah? Did Yunus complain to Allah? Yes, but how did he complain to Allah? What did he say to Allah? Just, مَسَّنِيَ الضُّرُّ You know, I'm, 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 I'm hurt. Literally, he said to Allah, I'm hurt. And you are the most merciful of those capable of having mercy. I'm hurt, and you know, and you're the most merciful. Simple as that. He didn't start to say, Oh Allah, my kids, Oh Allah, my, my money, Oh Allah, this happened, and this happened, and my health, and I used to do this, and I used to do that, and you ruined me, and why is this happening to me? No whys, none of that. Just, I'm hurt, oh Allah, and you never let me down. Right? So that shakwa, that complaining to Allah, if you have that capability of standing alone with Allah, at night calling upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you, if you develop that connection of dua, you don't feel a need to constantly vent to human beings. You don't. Why? Because I'm venting to the one who has mercy upon me. Right? And it makes me a better believer. And you wouldn't be calling upon Allah in private if you didn't believe He was listening to you, right? 
So that's, that's strengthening your faith. Why would I call upon Allah Nida and Khafiya if I don't even believe He's there? Right? So that strengthens your belief, it gives you more stability, it allows you to complain and vent to one who loves you and one who cares about you and one who wants good for you. Now, subhanAllah, I remember when I, when I first became Imam, you know, I thought when people come and ask questions, and it's funny because you really figure out that people, when they come to ask questions, they're not really coming to ask questions, they're usually giving you a fatwa or something like that, right? <laughs> people come to you and say, I have a question, Chef, all right, go ahead, ask your question. And it's, just, it's a statement. And I'm like, where's the question here, right? You know, so people come to you and they just, they talk at you sometimes, right? They just give you a statement, not a question. And then sometimes when people come to you seeking help, right? I thought, and, and, this is, and, and this is what's expected, whenever you go study overseas, you come back, you're, you're a counselor, you're a family counselor, you're a, a specialist in youth direct, direction, you're a specialist in everything, right? You're awesome because you study Sharia, so you clearly know how to do family counseling. So when people come and talk and grief counseling and stuff like that, whenever I try to give solutions, they just go further, right? They start crying more. And they start saying, I was like, okay, this isn't getting better. So I said, let me try something else. People will literally come sit in my office, I'd sit down, and they'd sit there and talk, and talk, and talk, and talk, and I'd say, SubhanAllah, may Allah make it easy. I'd make dua for them, and I wouldn't interrupt. Let them talk, 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 and at the end, phew, Zakallah, <laughs> You're such a good listener, SubhanAllah, you're amazing, it's really helpful. I'm like, wow, I didn't even say anything, but okay, great. So I should become a psychiatrist, put a nice little couch in the masjid, go ahead and have a seat, and then just give you a bill at the end of it, right? <laughs> go ahead, let it out, and then what happens? And then, the, I'm not degrading anyone who's in psychiatry, I'm not a psychiatry. But then what happened? And then what happened? And then what happened, right? Just talk it out, because sometimes talking it out pleases a person. It, 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 you get it off your chest, right? So develop that relationship with Allah in du'a, and that is your sharaf, that is your nobility, and your honor, your dignity, is that you don't need people, you are a caregiver. You are a caregiver. People can trust, because when you become stable, you can offer stability to others too, right? You are a caregiver, you are the upper hand. You're emotionally giving to people, you're not always emotionally receiving. You're financially trying to help people, you're not always financially receiving. So finding that, that balance. So again, five advices from Jibreel alayhi salam. What's the first one? Live as you will, you're going to die. The second one. Love who you want, you're going to depart from that person. The third one. Do what you want. Do what you want. You're going to be compensated as for what you've done. What's the fourth one? You got quieter. وَاعْلَمْ أَنَّ شَرَفَ الْمُؤْمِنِ قِيَامُ بِاللَّيْلِ Know that the nobility of the believer is his qiyamu layl, is his standing up at night. وَعِزَّهُ The fifth one, and his dignity, his honor, his izza, is still not mu'annas, is being independent of people, not needing people. Okay? Alright, any questions by the way, about this topic before I go to the next slide? I don't, I don't get bothered by questions, please feel free to ask. No? Alright, next. A meaningful life. Okay? It's all about attachments throughout this, this course. That's why it's important for us to look at that at the very beginning. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah Al-Hadid. Surah Al-Hadid. Okay? Verse... 19. What's that? You don't know the number. Third page, right? <laughs> okay. Know that the life of this world, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, know that the life of this world, la'ibun, wa lahwun. La'ib is play. La'ib wa lahwun which is amusement, wazina, superficiality, competition amongst yourselves, piling on money and living those, those, those same uh, things through your children, not necessarily having more children, living through your children the same superficiality, right? 
Okay? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us five stages that a person goes through in life. Now, before I go further than that, before I explain this verse further, you know, subhanAllah, when they, I remember there was, a, there was a book called The Hell of a Purposeless Life. The Hell of a Purposeless Life. And in Islam, the scholars of Tazkiyah called it Jaheem al -Burur. You can find this term always used in books of Tazkiyah, which is Jaheem al -Burur, The Hell of Being dis Deluded. Right? The hell on earth of being deluded. Okay? And subhanAllah, they, you know, they always say that, that, that the person that you should fear most is a man with no purpose. Right? When a person does not have a meaningful life, they naturally become anxious, depressed, reckless. Right? They naturally become an emotional wreck. So not having purpose in your life. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is describing the stages of life, the stages of dunya. And, and Imam al-Tabari rahimahullah and al-Ushayri, they said that this is chronological. Meaning what? When you're born into the world, what do you want to do? Play. Okay? It's all about play, 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 play. Everything is a toy. Your iPhone 5 is a toy. Okay? Everything is a toy. Okay? Nothing is not a toy. I just want to play. I'm not interested in anything else. Just play, 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 play. Of course, crying, pooping, and all that kind of stuff, throwing up. That's just the way that they are at that age, right? That we are at that age with play. Everything's about play. The second thing, amusements. The kid grows up, infant becomes toddler, and that's when you can put a child in front of Barney and let Barney sing the same song 400 times, and they will sit there and watch it 400 times. Right? Everything is amusement. They call it the zombie age. Right? You can put someone in front of a TV, you can entertain them. Every, every child at that age wants to be entertained. Everything is about being amused. Right? Being entertained. Right? Then, Zina. Then, all of a sudden, the toddler became a teenager. And then now it happens. Now it's all superficiality. Now you define your worth by how others define your worth. Right? The way that I look is all of a sudden so important. This is when boys will stand in the mirror for two hours, all right, making sure that their pink shirt is, is taken care of, is properly ironed and tucked in, right? Where all of a sudden you've got subhanAllah, every, like boys and girls, and everyone's all about appearance, 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 right? The type of music that you listen to is not because you like the music, it's because people will like that you like that music, right? You don't, you know, really at that age, I'm a person that doesn't have meaning, of course. At that age, you really live a very, very, very purposeless life at that age. I mean, that's the peak of it, right? It's all about show. It's all about how you look. It's all about, you know, how, how other people perceive you, perception. Then what happens, all of a sudden, teenager hits 18, 19, 20. And this isn't everybody, by the way. This is the normal cycle. Tafafurum vena, proving yourself, competition, right? This is when you go to your parents who changed your diaper 18 years ago and still remember it like yesterday and say, I'm a grown man. Right? Who do you think you are to talk to me that way? Right? When you start talking, when you, when you start, it's when, when, it, when you develop a certain sense of pride. Right? And by the way, it's dangerous. Subhanallah, that's a dangerous level of pride. You don't want anyone to tell you anything. You don't want anyone, you know, you're always feeling threatened and insecure. Right? At that age sometimes, it's just like, you know, who do you think you are? You now define, you're, you're now all about your degree, all about, you know, your position, right? Proving yourself to be, a, to be, to being grown, to being, you know, someone who, who deserves to be respected. Then, you get your degree, you get a lot of money, and you get married, i.e. you die, right? And then you, you know, you have children. That was a joke. I love my wife, and I'm very, very much so. And life is much better after marriage than it was before marriage. Okay? Now. <laughs> anyway. Um, that's true, by the way. Alhamdulillah. But anyway. Um, it's all about making money, having kids, making enough money to pay the bills. Right? And then after that, you, you have your kids and you try to live those same accomplishments through those kids. Okay? Really? I'm sorry, I'm going over time. I have a tendency to do that, by the way. 
Um, you know, it's about now you're living the same accomplishments through your kids that you have to look a certain way, you've got to dress a certain way, you've got to, you don't bring shame to the family and stuff like that, and you've got to, you know, you start living the same things through the kids, but at the same time, your life at the end of the day now becomes money and kids. Right? Money and kids. And you've still got, a, you've still got baggage from the rest of your stages, so some people act like children, even though they're 50 years old, they might act like children with their car. Right? They might be just as superficial as a 14 year old. Okay? They still have aspects of that. Okay? But at the same time, you know, life has really gotten meaningless at that point. It's just money and children. Okay? Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says something very powerful. Allah says, It's like a strong, beneficial rain came and some crops grew. Right, and the farmer got excited, right, and kufar, by the way, it means the same thing, kaf is to dig, conceal, right, it's a farmer, and it's meaning, right, a'jab al-kufar al-nabatu, your crops grew, and they became nice trees, right, nice, nice flowers, good crops, it seems to be, it's exactly what you wanted, and then what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? ثُمَّ يَهِيجُ Then the leaves turn yellow. SubhanAllah, a lot of times we jump that part, like a lot of tafsirs, you'll see that the, the, the Mufassir will jump that part. But this is a very profound part. Allah says the leaves start to dry up and you see it as yellow. You see it as yellow. Not that it becomes yellow. Oh, okay. Great. Not that it seems yellow. I got more than 10 minutes, I'm just letting you guys know. <laughs> Not that it seems yellow, but that you see it as yellow. Tarahu musfarwa. Then it completely disappears. Then it dries up and it dies. Right? Now think about this expression here. Tarahu musfarla. As people, subhanAllah, as human beings, we love what we don't possess. Right? You see something from the outside, it looks amazing. Once you get it, it's not fulfilling anymore. Right? It's not fulfilling. I need something else now. Right? iPhone 1, iPhone 2, iPhone 3, iPhone 4, Steve Jobs died, you know, iPhone 5, right? And it's the same thing as an iPhone 4 from what I've heard anyway, you know, very little difference, but got to have the next one, got to have the next one. I get a car, you know, I get the, the latest model of a certain car, and then, you know, it, it looks amazing before I buy it, I'm excited. I drive it around for two weeks, then next year the same car comes out, but the lights move a little bit differently. I got to have that car, right? <laughs> Move on. You get a nice house, big house, you put yourself in 30 years of debt slavery so that you can live in this house, and then you have to drive an extra hour of work and work more so that you can pay off the bills on that house. Within a few months, another house pops up, your friends buy another house, and that house looks nicer than my house. Right? SubhanAllah. You know, the, the, the eye, the eye always, it always perceives, you know, SubhanAllah. This, that's what Shaitan does. He just beautifies things from the outside. Then when you get them again, you're miserable because it didn't meet your expectations. And think about this for a moment. Every single time, every single time, I just want you to think about this. this is psychology, by the way, I know I, I hate speaking to people. There might be psychology majors here. They might come to me and try to start trying to correct me and stuff like that. You might be right. But anyway, um, so I, you know, think about this for a moment. You buy a car, a very nice car, a brand new car. It looks amazing on the outside. In two weeks, Three weeks, a month, tops, it's just a car. At the end of the day, it's just a car. A person who owns the, you know, who owns a car that is $40,000 cheaper, but does the same thing, which takes a person to and from work and where they need to go, sees their car as the same way after just a few weeks. Because at the end of the day, it's just a car. It's just a house. Right? In the beginning, it looks amazing. Let's enslave ourselves to have this mansion. Great. You know, for 30 years we're going to be paying off this debt. To live in this, to live in this, this beautiful mansion with all this art and stuff like that. At the end of the day, you're just like a person who's living in an apartment. Because it's just the place that you sleep. You're not going to walk in every time and go, MashaAllah, that poor that Right? At the end, it's not going to be big enough for you. It's going to be different. It's not artsy enough. Right? We gotta go spend some more money, and more money, and more money. The point that's, that Allah is making, everything turns yellow. Think about it, everything turns yellow. It's not green anymore after you own it, everything turns yellow. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is describing this, these phases that we go through in life. 
from, from being an infant, from being a baby to being an old person, as it's basically like a hamster in a wheel. You're not getting anywhere. You're running, but you're not getting anywhere. Okay? You're moving on from one stage to another. And the faster that you break that addiction, the happier you will be. Right? So you look at a person, for example, who found Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at a very young age. Really, really found Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like developed a strong attachment to Allah at a very young age. The quicker that you break that addiction, the easier the withdrawal will be. Right? And at the same time, the happier you will be. SubhanAllah, just naturally. You found Allah at an early age. You found meaning and purpose in your life. Right? You, found, you find meaning and purpose in your life. You know, this ayah is so amazing. Allah says, and then in the hereafter you're punished. Meaning what? It was, it was already punishment. It was adab. It was punishment to keep achieving what you thought was going to give you happy, get you happy, and then become miserable as a result. The, you know, subhanAllah, the, the highest number of suicides in this country consistently every year is from top earners, CEOs, celebrities. Right? When's the last time you found a celebrity that was really happy? You know, there is some fraction, but it's because they're doing me meaningful stuff. Right? They did meaningful stuff with their money, they lived on and they moved on to purpose, charity, whatever it may be. But usually what happens is that that celebrity who's in all of this glamour is going to end up dying in some hotel bathroom or going to end up drowning in some pool or going to be found behind a 7-Eleven with a needle in inside. Something is going to happen and you're going to be like, whoa. Right? I was always the music kind of I'm still on AOL, so is Steve. Where's Steve? Steve here? Me and Steve are still on AOL. We're still loyal. The first email address I've ever had is still my email address today. Alright? And they always have this up. Uh, the newest thing that pops up is always, what happened to your favorite 80s star? You know, how do they look now? Right? And it's like, sometimes you're curious. It's like, okay. Love I'm not even alive. Well, I'm like, family matters. Yeah, that's I'm like, whoa. It's like you see this nice little happy child, and then the next thing you know, you see someone like with black makeup all over, like, busted up in a mugshot or something like that. It's like, what happened to that person? Right? Man, you really fell off. You guys remember the show Different Strokes? Anybody remember Different Strokes? Right? Gary Coleman? And the white dad of two black children, which apparently solved the entire race problem in the United States, right? And what was the older brother of Gary Coleman named? Willis. Willis, which you're talking about Willis, right? 80 shows, right? Willis, okay? Anyone know what happened to Willis after, like, that show? Yeah, he went on gym and got busted up all kinds of stuff. All kinds of stuff, right? He's... Terrible things. It's probably, I remember watching the interview with him. And it's like, you know... Why are you so miserable? What happened? You know, you were like a golden child. You know, what, what, what's it all about? And he says, because I thought that stuff was going to make me happy. Right? Gurur. Gurur. I thought that stuff was going to make me happy. I thought that thing was going to make me happy. Right? And I remember there was another celebrity, and somehow I don't even want to mention her name. But, you know, you always see celebrities that do crazy, crazy, crazy stuff. I don't watch TMZ. I don't watch any of that stuff. I don't watch any of that nonsense or garbage. I think it's absolutely pointless and worthless. But, subhanAllah, sometimes you really, really do take lessons from that. I'll never forget, there was one celebrity that was being interviewed, also crazy, depression, checked into clinics and all that kind of stuff, and always miserable and things of that sort. Had it all. Money, fame, glamour. And, you know, they're like, what do you... And, and the, the question from the interviewer was like, what do you want? Right? What do you want? And she said, I just want to be able to take my son out for an ice cream cone and not have a paparazzi in my face. Think about how profound that answer is. You had that. I have that. You have that. Right? But subhanAllah, you know, you work your entire life for fame, you work your entire life for celebrity status, then you're lonely. Then, you know, you're not happy. You work your entire life for money, and your money has driven gaps between you and your family members. You don't really know who's really your friends, who's really betraying you, and things of that sort. It's misery up there. It's misery. Right? And the idea here, again, is they thought it was going to be fulfilling, and it's not fulfilling at all. Right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, imagine the hamster in the wheel. Right? You're chasing after something that's non-existent. So having a meaningful life really does... Uh, change a lot of things, and subhanAllah, what we find from that, good deeds, doing Islamic work, doing good deeds. Rasulullah said in the hadith in Ahmad's, 
Ida salat ka hasanatuka. Five minutes or ten minutes? I can finish. Ten? Okay. Do you guys mind going ten more minutes? No. You don't mind? Okay. Ida salat ka hasanatuka. Wasaat ka sayyatuk fa anta mu'min. It's a beautiful hadith in Muslim Imam Ahmad Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, If your good deeds make you happy and your bad deeds make you sad, you're a believer. At the very least, you're, there, is, there is iman there. You know, it might be a little bit of iman, but something's inside of you. Right? You get happy when you do good deeds, and you feel bad when you do bad deeds. Right? Even if it's not that much guilt, but there's still some, some belief inside of you. The more your belief is, the, more, the worse you will feel when you commit a sin, and the better you'll feel when you do a good deed. The idea here is not that a person becomes proud when they do good deeds. It's not that you have urge, that you become judgmental and self-righteous and things of that sort. Right? The idea here is that good deeds make you happy. Okay? They should make you happy. You feel good when you pray Salat al-Fajr, right? You feel good when you pray Qiyamun You feel good when you make time to read Quran. You feel good when you took time to do Dua. You feel good when you give charity. Right? It's a natural good feeling. Okay? It's just how we are. It's how we're programmed. And in fact, Ata rahimahullah, he said very beautifully, he said that everything in, 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 that's material,